Welcome to Independent Sources. I'm Viano Ravinka. And I'm Gary Pierre Pierre. The earthquake that rocked Haiti didn't spare anyone, including the media. Damage to buildings and antennas stopped the presses at newspapers and silenced most of the airwaves. In the years since the demise of the Duvalier dictatorship, the press had become a vibrant institution and journalists were playing a vital role in the country's struggling democracy. Now that role is in jeopardy. On this edition of Independent Sources, we explore measures that can be put in place to help rebuild Haiti's media. We looked at the dynamics between the Dominican Republic and Haiti since the earthquake. Closer to home, we report on the new state controller's efforts to reach a range of communities. And we profile the online publication blackandbrownnews.com. We'll have those stories and news of the week after this. Ethnic media is important because it's a bridge between ethnic communities and the larger American community. The pioneering Haitian radio journalist Jean Dominique called the press the barometer that measures his country's mood. Well, right now that one is pretty somber for Haitian media. The earthquake stopped the presses at daily newspapers and destroyed many radio stations, the major source of news for Haitians. To look at what can be done to rebuild Haiti's news media, I'm joined by Tala Dola Chahi of Reporters Without Borders, Carlos Loria of the Committee to Protect Journalists, and Haitian reporter Jean Roland Chéry. Welcome. Thank you very Come much. For Jean Roland, I wanted to start with you. Um, you know, a couple of weeks ago, a major earthquake devastated Haiti, as we all know. How do you think the Haitian media perform under this situation? Hey, thank you, Gary. Uh, I can say uh, the situation of the journalists now in Haiti uh, is very difficult. Before the air kick, the situation was bad okay. to making the work uh, daily. But now it's hoarse because we can no, no we know uh, the radio station collapsed, so many of them, and journalists, they, they are victims also, as the population. Okay. And they have to continue to work as a journalist at the same time, uh, living their own life daily with their family, okay. without clothes without a uh, house to live. But they were just as affected as, as everybody else. Everybody else. Okay. But still, how do you think they were able to overcome all their personal tragedies and uh, keep the population informed of what was going on? We have a, a, a lot of determination because uh, as a victim, they still continue to, to give information to the population. And now, not only information, the radio station doing a service work also, like a, a give water to the population. As example, we have Radio Caraib mm -hmm. giving energy electric to the population and sure. the area to recharge their phone, their cellular phone, because uh, they have to call the family, they have to call parents, they have to call a, a outside the sure, country. Sure. They have to communicate to, with Yeah, people, to keep yeah, them sure. in touch uh, about what happened in Haiti. And in this case, the journalist not only is doing their job as a professional, but also a work as a, a civil servant. Okay, yeah. You know, um, Tala, mm -hmm. what is Reporters Without Borders doing to help journalists who have been affected, as Jean has said? Well, we set up a media operations center on January 21st. We work with the Minister of Communications and Culture, and the government was very supportive of this center, primarily for local press. We wanted to really help local journalists who were kind of victims, their families that had their houses falling down, they had seen their colleagues die. We wanted to set up a hub, a community, uh, not only providing broadband, internet, some equipment for them, but also a community for them to get back on track and start writing those news stories about their members of their community. I mean, journalists, as our colleague has just said, are members of civil society. They are part and parcel of this culture in Haiti, mm -hmm. and we really wanted to get them up and running. 
Carlos, what about the community well, protection? Well, yes, uh, the first step uh, is to uh, hire our friend Shano Langerie, who has mm -hmm. worked for Radio Haiti Inter, has a lot of contacts in Haiti as a consultant mm -hmm. to make an assessment of uh, what are the needs for the Haitian media. There are so many things going on. So Jean-Rolin has established contacts with uh, many uh, organizations in the ground, Guy Delva with the uh, SOS Journalist, Jacques Derossier with the Association of Haitian Journalists, Marcus Garcia who uh, has a, a, a media uh, owners organization, and Richard Whitmire also director of Radio Metropole to know uh, what journalists' needs are you know, they, uh, they are grieving their families, uh, their uh, uh, friends, uh, they don't have uh, homes, uh, they don't have water, and uh, so that's one of the th first things we did. We opened uh, an account, our journalist assistance program, at Help Journalists, where uh, people can donate money for, uh, for Haitian journalists in need. Uh, and uh, in our CPJ blog uh, at www.cpj.org, Jean Roland, myself, Guidelva, yourself, uh, Gary, are writing um, pieces every day about the uh, situation of mm -hmm. uh, Haitian journalists, you know, that have suffered a lot. More than 10 journalists have been killed. Uh, many radio stations uh, have been destroyed, not only in Port-au-Prince, but only in the country's interior. Uh, in, in very important cities. You know, you mentioned everyone here, we're talking about radio, radio. Uh, Jean Chéry, give us a sense of why is radio so important uh, for Haiti, for Haitians? First of all, because this is the uh, oral society. Okay. Everybody speak, uh, not too much people read newspaper. In a, in a society where you, you have 70, between 70 and 80 of the population illiterate. That means radio is a man has a big role in that society. Mm -hmm. That's why uh, when the radio station shut down, cannot work uh, uh, like uh, last week mm -hmm. after the air kick, it was a very big problem for the population. It was a big void. Yeah. You know, uh, internet is uh, it's not uh, it's difficult to find. Sure, you have to have a lot of money. Yeah, yeah, it costs a lot of money to have internet and access. And also, when cell phone is down, radio is the last thing that exists to make the population communicate together. Not only now, but before, okay. with the transistor radio. Mm -hmm. Now, Tala, Haiti's two daily newspapers have shut down. They haven't been able to publish anything. Um, is there any movement uh, to help them restore publication of some sort? Of course. I mean, th there are a number of, of local media that are trying to get back and, and running. And Reporters Without Borders, you can find on our website, rsf.org, has set up a campaign to help uh, Haitian journalists, especially local press, get back up and running. A lot of these buildings collapsed, and these agencies are now trying to find their correspondents. Many people in Haiti have gone north, have left Port-au-Prince in the areas most devastated. They're trying to get a hold of their colleagues, find out where everybody is. I mean, this has just been a number of weeks. We have to remember mm -hmm. that it's way too soon to get all these operations back and running, but we're very supportive of trying to get people located, trying to get office space, because there's very few buildings that are still left in Port-au-Prince. Mm -hmm. Get them to get office space, get some funding um, to set up their operations. Speaking of funding, I know you're doing a, a you just mentioned you're doing a fundraising for Haiti. Do you have any sense of how much, what's your target for that? Uh, well, I mean, first we, uh, we, we need to do an assessment of what the needs are. And then uh, according to uh, what the needs are, and we are hearing from, from people every day, uh, journalists that have, have uh, been hurt, that have been wounded, uh, you know, uh, offices destroyed, equipment destroyed. After doing a, a you know, a, a very good assessment of what is what is needed, we are going to uh, deploy our 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 funds to to help uh, to help journalists meet. As as General Lang was saying, radio is very important, and it's very important also not only in Port au Prince, Gary. There are cities that have suffered also <coughs> in the country's interior where radio is uh, you know the only mm -hmm. the only media. And cities like Leogan, Petit, Goava, uh, Javel uh -huh. have been seriously hit and also uh, need our attention. That's why uh, we have been in touch with uh, 
with people from uh, uh, radio com community radio stations in the, in the interior to know what, what the needs are. You know, uh, John, let's talk about being a reporter in Haiti, the difficulties, as you mentioned yourself. And, and now, do jo Haitian journalists have to be uh, as much part of the story as they've been before? Or how do they play it for go moving forward? It, it's uh, uh, difficult because they have to, they have a conscious professional first. They have to keep doing their job. But also, uh, they have to think about the daily basis of the society, of, of themselves. Uh, when you have a, a journalist uh, who his wife is pregnant, he cannot find a hospital now. Uh, uh, pregnancy is complicated. You cannot find a hospital for him. It's it's difficult. It's terrible because they give prior priority to the worst wounded now injured. And in this case, uh, the journalist has to think about doing his job and at the same time how he can help his family. And on the other side, the work of journalist also is on a, a, a basis terrible. When I talk to uh, Mario Vio, the director of Signal FM, mm -hmm. he told me... Oh, by the way, Signal FM was for the, the, only, the only station, station that operated yeah. for a few days in Port-au-Prince because the other ones were destroyed. Yes, I just yeah. want to make that... Uh, it was really readers, a lifeline, yeah. Yeah, essentially. Our viewers media. understood. Mario Vio, the director of Signal FM, radio station, he told me, when they are break, it's difficult to find something to eat and water, sometimes to drink. All the restaurants, they, they collapse. And it's the market also, supermarket, they collapse. When you, you, you have the money, you don't have nothing to eat. And in this case, you have to come back to the microphone to give the news to the population. At the same time, you're hungry. This is a very big challenge for these journalists now. Unfortunately, we'll have to leave it at that. But this is a topic I'm sure we'll revisit in the future. Tala Dolachahi, Carlos Loria, and Jean Roland Chéry, thanks for being with us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Now, here's Abby Ishola with some other news making headlines. Thanks, Gary. Here's a look at some headlines from the ethnic media. Haitians living in America have expressed concerns for their homeland in a poll sponsored by New America Media. More than half of the 400 respondents from the study say they are willing to adopt or foster a Haitian child orphaned by the earthquake that left the impoverished island devastated. From the Amsterdam News, New York City Councilman Charles Barron has blasted members of the council for voting him out as chair of the Higher Education Committee. The Brooklyn Councilman criticized Speaker Christine Quinn for recommending his removal and called the final decision racist. Councilmember Idanis Rodriguez from Washington Heights has been appointed to fill the position. Caribbean Life reports that a pilot program to help U.S. deportees is underway in Guyana and some Caribbean islands. The International Organization of Migration will provide funding to help deportees with criminal records who need financial assistance to resettle in their homelands. From Novoye Raskoye Slovo, a Russian couple has been sentenced to prison for advising people to identify as persecuted gays or Jews to receive political asylum in the U.S. Sergei Timovev and Yelena Gryeva surrendered over 30 boxes of false asylum requests to U.S. authorities. And finally, Orthodox Jews have become the newest target audience for newspapers. This at a time when mainstream media is complaining about shrinking readership. The Forward reports that members of the Orthodox community rely heavily on newspapers on the Sabbath since electronics are prohibited. This has led to the success of several Jewish publications, including the Jewish Star from Long Island, which is now expanding to New York City. Those are just a few headlines from the ethnic media. Back to you, Vianora. We continue to get extensive coverage of the situation in Haiti in the aftermath of the earthquake. 
but what's happening in the Dominican Republic? Haiti's neighbor on the island of Hispaniola, which was used as a base for many rescue and relief operations. There's been a long history of bad blood between the two countries. Has this natural disaster helped change that dynamic? Joining us from Santo Domingo via Skype to talk about the Dominican response is Fulbright scholar and freelance journalist Erika Martinez. Hello, Erika. Thanks for joining us. Hi, thank you. Erika, break it down for us and explain how exactly has the DR been impacted by the quake in Haiti? Well, it began with the earthquake itself. Um, we felt the earthquake here um, when it hit Haiti, but it was a lot, um, it, it was very minimal here. It didn't cause um, uh, any damage here in the Dominican Republic. Um, at, in Santo Domingo specifically. Um, some areas in the southwest had some damages to hospitals and they're trying to repair them now, especially now that um, they're overflowing um, with patients. Let's talk about the border. Uh, we had our own Gary Pierre Pierre reporting from the area the other week and he gave us a very positive image about how the Dominican border officials have been uh, making an effort at making the customs process, to, the process go smooth. But then you have some reports in the mainstream media here talking about uh, the border having been militarized. Uh, what's, what's your take on that? In the beginning, there was a lot of restriction at the border because um, a lot of people wanted to go into Haiti. Um, so in the beginning, if you wanted to go there uh, and make donations or go find family members, um, they didn't want people going to um, Haiti without um, without support um, because there wouldn't be a place for them to stay or um, there wouldn't be food for the people that were going in. As far as people coming out, there there was control um, as usual, um, but that has uh, not, um, that has hasn't been as strict. In fact, there the officials have not um, required um, um, visas um, from in people who needed medical care. Um, and then in the Jabon in the north, um, they opened um, a bridge that was recently constructed so that there could be um, uh, uh, easier flow so that there wasn't a bottleneck up north uh, because they, that, that bridge was recently built um, and it hadn't passed inspection, but they made sure that everything was okay. And so now there's um, there's more uh, traffic flow through the northwest border in Dajabon. So there are some uh, non-governmental Dominican organizations who are reporting from the border that there has been an influx of, of immigration um, within uh, DR from Haiti. What are you hearing about it within the Dominican Republic and how are Dominicans reacting to it? Well, um, now it's, it's been several weeks since the earthquake and I, I think that, the, that there is more um, worry, um, uh, if you want to call it that way, about oh, you know, an, an increase in um, Haitian migration to the Dominican Republic. Um, and you know, there's, you know, people will say, well, now, now Haitians will really want to come into the Dominican Republic. Um, and there's also concern about um, the hospitals, especially along the border, um, that they're all, that they're full and that they're um, unable to provide services to the Dominican people. So I think that, um, that, that now, um, since they're still, you know, um, that there's still more people coming in. There is more um, talk coming from fear of um, of Haitians using Dominican resources. Is this uh, transparent in the media headlines you're seeing in the Dominican Republic? How has the media there been covering the disaster? There has been a lot of coverage about what the uh, the Dominican government is doing, specifically about the president. The media coverage has also been focusing a lot on how the private sector, how organ, um, you know, um, industries are 
are interested in helping Haitians. So you, you mentioned some concerns, some fears that are surfacing, um, but initially when the, the quake st uh, struck, and of course uh, the Dominican Republic has provided outstanding support and relief to, to Haiti, uh, there have been talks about uh, renewed hope for uh, amending of uh, the hard feelings that have long existed between the two countries. How do you see the relations uh, being uh, months from now? Um, I see the relations being a lot, lot better. When I talk to people, um, family and friends, they they all concur that um, that uh, relationships between Haitians and Dominicans will never be the same. They're they're going to be so much better because of the um, of the way the Dominican people have helped. It hasn't just been the government and uh, the private sector. It's been Dominican people themselves. I mean, people have taken time off of work to go and volunteer, to coordinate efforts from here, receiving donations and sending them there, um, sending people to work in um, camps in Haiti, in Port-au-Prince specifically. So um, it's, and, and when you look at the way people um, individually have been helping, that's when you see that there really has been a change in uh, <clears throat> uh, in between the, the, the two countries. And Erica, we'll have to leave it at that for now. Erica Martinez, thanks for talking with us. Okay, thank you. We'll be right back. We Americans are always at our best when we hear and heed the cries of others. When confronted with massive human suffering, Americans have always stepped up and answered the call to help. But there's never been anything on a scale of human tragedy in our own hemisphere, like what we're now witnessing in Haiti. Today, President Clinton and I are joining together to appeal to you with real urgency. Give now, and lives will be saved. Thank you. Thank you. With New York's economy remaining on the rocks, State Controller Thomas DiNapoli says it's especially important that every citizen have access to the information he compiles. Recently, the state's chief financial officer opened his doors to the ethnic media as a way to stay plugged into diverse communities throughout the state. Abby Shola reports. Current downturn at a state fit. New York's dismal economy was the main topic at a recent press conference held by New York State Comptroller Thomas DiNapoli. We are in a very difficult fiscal time for a couple of reasons. The first is obvious. This recession has hit New York very hard. But this wasn't a typical press briefing. Comptroller DiNapoli partnered with the New York Community Media Alliance to speak specifically with reporters from the ethnic media. Juana Ponce de Leon, director of the organization, says events like this will help create better reporting from the ethnic media. I think that in general, when they have uh, press briefings and they invite uh, mainstream corporate uh, venues to come and cover the event, that we have found that the ethnic journalist or the community journalist doesn't get a chance to really ask questions. I think it's important for, for the communities to have reporting that's really pertinent to their realities. Journalists from ethnic news outlets like Singh Tao Daily and the Pakistani Post attended the event. Many posed questions about job losses, the economic crisis in New York, and how these issues continue to affect the communities they cover. The economy is not very good. The Chinese community, there are so many uh, small business, and um, they really care about what the, the state, what they are going to do. So, yeah, it's very important for the Chinese community to know the economic, and they, they get to meet the controller, know who he is, and how he looks, and what's his policy for the coming year. One of the comptroller's goals is to remain accessible to the ethnic media. The ethnic media is such an important resource for, for people in our communities. Uh, and we want to be sure, because we have a lot of information that we put out, a lot of reports, a lot of analysis. We want to make sure that everyone living in New York has access to this information. Information that is critical for immigrants to navigate the city's own economic crisis during a time when New York faces an $8 billion deficit. For independent sources, Abby Ishola. 
We end our show with a profile of blackandbrownnews.com, a website with news and information of particular interest to the African American and Latino communities. And Jeanette Levert sat down with founder Sharon Toomer to talk about the inspiration for the online publication. Right here is where we started, blackandbrownnews.com, in this area. Sharon Toomer is the founder and editor-in-chief of blackandbrownnews.com. It is a free member-based website devoted to distributing news and information to and about the black and Afro-Latino diaspora. A former news reporter and TV producer, Toomer says that her jobs in mainstream media inspired her to create BBN, where minority perspectives would be heard. She launched the website in September 2006. The original concept was that users throughout the world, they would generate the content. It didn't work out that way. In order to keep the site fresh and with new information, we do internally post a lot of the stories. We have some loyalists, some diehard BBN fans who um, keep, uh, post their own stories. And then we also have what we call now our roving reporters. These are people who send us um, news stories that we miss. You need to post this. After figuring out what worked, BBN began introducing original content through freelance writers. They also launched a video report series. They cover her whole body, you can only see her face. In September 2008, Toomer decided to poll BBN members about presidential party nominees in advance of Super Tuesday. And our polls actually um, came out, actually told the story of what was ultimately going to happen. Barack Obama was the victor, meaning he was the Democratic nominee, and John McCain was the Republican nominee. It was huge for us. That success kicked off political heavy news coverage that included reporting on both the Democratic and Republican conventions. But for New York Community Media Alliance, black and brown news would not have been at those conventions. They're the ones who sought our press credentials. Um, and even still, um, we had, they really had to fight to get us in there. Besides access, resources is the other fight. Having started the website with her own money, Toomer is looking for ways to make it self-sustaining. One option in the works is a partnership with a larger company, like two black news websites have already done, TheRoot.com with Washington Post and Griot.com with NBC News. CBN recently won first place at the Immigrant and Ethnic Press Awards called the Ippies. The website won for an editorial about News Corp's purchase of several New York community newspapers. BBN plans more award-winning coverage by focusing on a couple of key issues this year. One would be immigration and this anti-immigrant sentiment that concerns us. One would be this incessant violence that seems to only plague uh, black and brown communities. It is unconscionable that whole communities uh, on a daily basis endure the degree of violence that they do. It's that kind of focus and passion that has led BBN to where it is today and where it hopes to go tomorrow. And Jeanette Levert for Independent Sources. That's our show. Thanks for watching and we'll see you again next week. In the meantime, be independent minded.